I'm sorry about that, guys. I wasn't really expecting to go first. Kind of caught off guard. Sorry. The first piece I'm going to share with you this evening was written because of the story we discussed in a class of mine about the Armenian genocide. Not that many people know a lot about it, but there was a particular instance in which Armenian Christian women were forced out of their homes to dance in a circle, and their children told to stand and applaud. As the mothers were set on fire, the children were told, if you stop clapping, you cry, you scream, or you run, you'll die too. From the perspective of one of those children. It is often said that soldiers with post-traumatic stress hate the sound of car backfires or ceiling fans because they remind them of helicopters and gunshots. Oh, I just lost my page. Um, so how do I tell you why I hate the smell of matches? Not to put candles on the cake or that applause to me sound, sound less reward, more death mark step. That if you do any of these things, I will not cry, not because it does not well up inside me like a flood or rush me like boiling magma, but because there was no crying then, at least not for very long. How do I tell you? My children have never heard the lullabies I grew up with because anytime I sing the songs of my own country, it sounds like God is playing taps. God was, after all, the conductor of that ghastly symphony. He heard the unshed tears of we children and took to him the ones who cried out loud. Took to him my mother. For a long time, I questioned how he could do this. Allowed such great suffering to exist in his name that I remember the sacrifice of his own son and think that must have been what this was then, a sacrifice. So my mother could watch over all other children other than just her own, children need mothers in times like this, all children. Uh, okay, I have one more piece for you this evening. This was uh, written as a gift for somebody very special to me about how people affect our self-image. When she tells you you're not good enough, I tell you not to let her version of your reflection be the one by which you dress yourself for the day. You answer, it's not all, it's, <laughs> You answer, it's not always the same, I can't help it, she's my mom, it's hard to argue with that. Because as children, we dress ourselves da daily by the mirrors they provide. You've gotten so used to dressing in the dark in clothes that don't quite fit you uh, 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 to avoid the version of yourself she taught you to grow into. When she breaks the dragon pieces from the corners of the glass, digs them into you thinking it will make you stronger, I undo the buttons to clean the wounds, watch you shrink into what's left of her looking glass. Back to the little boy that is uncertain, who is scared, who judges the man he will become by the deep scars, but scars are evidence of the choice to survive. They are mile markers of our journey to strength, not proof of weakness. I understand she is your mother, but she is also not the only one who can break a mirror. Take it by its rough edges, let it shatter. Pick up the shards from the heap that reflect your heart, your honesty, your love, your kindness toss aside the ones that show the parts of you you believe are not enough. Press the shards you keep together like a jigsaw puzzle. There will be gaps. Take those pieces from my mirror, the ones you can't find in your own. Pick up the pieces from all those around you. Then hold your hands out. I'll clean the wounds, wash off the blood, remove the bits of glass that you can't remove yourself. Then, sti then stitch up the deep cuts so you can appreciate the scars as mile markers of learning to love yourself. 